2 Timothy chapter 3, you there say amen. You know, unfortunately, I started this, <laughs> I started this series of sermons a month ago, and I've preached one sermon in this series, and it's, some of it was out of my control, uh, others was scheduling, where I was scheduled to be at other places speaking and preaching, but here we are back together, just little old me and little old y'all, and uh, it's good to be back home preaching. Uh, so we started this series a month ago, and the title of this sermon, or the series of sermons, is Doing Life by the Book. And I'll just tell you what all of this is about is, uh, the, this is God's Word calling God's people back to His Word. God's Word, God's law. How many of you think of this as law? Uh, this declares itself to be law. And we don't like to use that. Let me tell you why we don't like to use that. We don't like to be told what to do. I don't and you don't. That's our nature. We just don't like folks telling us what to do. Uh, we, don't think, we, we don't like things uh, running us up in a corner, pinning us down, convicting us, putting any pressure on us. Boy, we're just not that way. But this is God's law. It's, it's not 66 books of suggestions. Uh, it's not 66 books of yacht twos or yottas or if you did. Uh, it's, it's God's law. And it's his word. And uh, I'm just going to tell you, man, under no uncertain terms that the church of Jesus Christ has left the law behind. We've left the word. Our people have left the word. Now, how do you know that, preacher? Oh, my gosh. It's so evident, isn't it? Never before has it been so evident that the light of the world, the city set on a hill, the bride of Christ, would be so dim, so quiet in this world. Our families are suffering because of it. That's so apparent, man. You can't avoid the dysfunction of families. Uh, and so this is just God's Word calling us, His people, who belong to Him, His possessions, back to lining up with God's Word, building our lives on it building our families on it, running our businesses on it, especially operating our churches on it. So that's what this is all about, doing life by the book. Obviously, when you don't follow the law, we had some friends uh, come over to the rodeo yesterday and brought a load of boys from Mississippi. And uh, they called and they got delayed and Jimbo redid the schedule and move some roping events up so that we could wait on those young men to ride bulls and steers and all. Anyway, first thing they did when they got here, man, they said, man, we got a ticket on the way over here. I said, let me guess, parking? They were like, how'd you know that? I said, I've been through parking. I've given money to the cause. I know about parking. It's famous for a scrap iron place, but it's also famous for taking your money. Uh, but anyway, they broke the law. I broke the law. Man, I was flying through there. I was going the back way, and I think, ain't no cops back here. Oh, my goodness. SWAT team got me in parking. And I give them money. I did. I give them money because I broke the law. Breaking the law has consequences, and we get away from God's law, God's word. There's consequences, and we are reaping what we have sowed in our families and in our churches. But we're going to focus mostly on the family today. Uh, what do we need more than anything to fix our churches? Uh, boy, we need some educated preachers. That's what we need. Boy, we got educated preachers. I ain't one of them, but uh, we've got plenty of preachers with all kind of letters behind their names who have invested in education. We've built seminaries here and overseas to educate those in less fortunate circumstances. We don't need educated preachers. We got them. We need, uh, we need better worship leaders, right? Oh, man. Where are you going to find better worship than we had here this morning? By the way, worship does not come from a stringed instrument, and it doesn't come from a guy that's talented to sing. Worship comes from your heart. Worship comes from your relationship with Jesus. You don't have to have any music. You don't have to have anybody leading you. If you're in love with Jesus and you want to worship him, you can worship him on the creek bank, on the back of your horse, <laughs> on a tractor, wherever you're at and whatever you're doing. Worship comes from the heart. We don't need that. We got that. 
Here's what we need. We need men and women who live by the book. Men and women who are just in love with God's Word because they know it's God's. Um, and we've, we've lived generation after generation. There's so much water that's went under the bridge of life that here we are. Nobody can be in denial about our situation. Nobody can say, well, our families are okay. No, they're not. They're broken. Our kids are broken. And it's because we've deviated from God's Word. If it was a book of suggestions, we wouldn't have anything to complain about. But it's law, and we've moved away from it, and here we are, we've arrived, and it's not good. We need men and women who know God's Word, who love God's Word, and who value God's Word enough to implement it into their lives. Not something we just reference every now and then. Not just something that uh, we might take a casual glance at so that it might have some, some neat sayings or something that we could glean from, but something that we operate out of, something that we go to first and foremost every time. Uh, and we're reaping the consequences because we're not here. L look at what Paul warns Timothy about and. Blake mentioned this. By the way, Blake did a great job sharing the hope that we have in Christ yesterday in the arena uh, at our rodeo. Thank you, Blake. I don't know if you're in here or not, probably in security. But uh, thank you for doing that, being a wonderful lay speaker. And he mentioned this. He didn't go in depth into it, uh, obviously. But when any time you hear 2 Timothy chapter 3, those first five verses, as Paul, an apostle, instructs this young preacher, Timothy, and he really is warning him here, and he's saying, look, Timothy, this is how it's going to be in the days to come. Some translation says perilous times. Uh, the English Standard Version says difficult times. But anytime this is read, because it, as we read it, we just automatically say, oh, yeah, man, that's the world, boy. That's exactly how the world is. The only problem is Paul's not talking about the world. This letter wasn't written to the world. This, this letter wasn't written about church. It's just an evangelistical pastoral epistle. <laughs> See, I am a smart preacher, ain't I? <laughs> this isn't about the world. And this is why it's so heartbreaking. This is about the church, guys. Paul's saying, Timothy, this is how the church is going to look. And it's going to be difficult times. Now, as I read this, you're going to find yourself saying, no, come on. That's not about the world. Well, you explain to me, who's it to? He didn't mention the world in here. He's, not, he's talking to a preacher about the flock and about how the church should operate. And Paul says, Timothy, verse 1, chapter 3, 2 Timothy, you there say amen. Realize this, in the last days, let me just explain last days, ever since the crucifixion of Christ, we've been in the last days. Yesterday we were close, today we're closer, tomorrow we'll be closer to the return of Christ. We're in the last days. He says, in the last days, difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, disobedient, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, Reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Let me read that again. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And here's really what keys us in that it's talking to the church. Verse 5. Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Let this sink in. This is a group of people that's holding to a, a form of of God. That, that describes religion. It's holding to a form of godliness, but they have denied, said no, no to the power. And that's what we've done with God's Word. We've said no to the Word. I don't need that in my family. I don't need that in my life. I don't need that in my business. Uh, I went to college. Uh, I, I don't need that. We've denied the power of it by saying no. And his final word in that Fifth verse is avoid such men. 
Look, if you ever go to a church and a pastor walks to the pulpit and he don't bring this with him, run. Unless he's got this memorized, and some of them do. This is all I've got to give you guys. If I tell you something, it'll be wrong. This is right. This is accurate. This is, this is right on. This is unmistakable. It's undeniable. We can't deny its power because it'll influence our life for the positive, not the negative. Look down at verse 16. Paul brings Timothy right to where he needs to be by focusing him and centering him on God's Word. Verse 16 of that chapter says, All Scripture, some translations like old King Jimmy says, is God-breathed. Here it says, all Scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable. How many of y'all are into prophets? I am, man. I want to make all I can off anything, right? Earning, winning, profitable. The Word of God is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped, for every good work. What do we need in our churches today more than anything? We need men, we need women, we need teenagers, we need children that is equipped in God's Word. Now in chapter 5 of Ephesians, where we're fixing to go, go ahead and turn there if you will. It's the last time I'm going to ask you to turn. Uh, we're going to camp out in Ephesians 5 for a long time as, as we address these subjects uh, that this sermon takes us to. Uh, equipped for God's Word, or equipped through God's Word for what He's called us to be and what He's called us to do. That's the value of God's Word. We need men, we need women who have been taught by God's Word, corrected by God's Word, encouraged by God's Word, trained by God's Word for righteousness so that they can pass it on to the children. We were outside praying, and they were... Richard was sitting there with four or five little old boys, and they weren't paying attention. They're little boys. Little boys don't pay attention. Did you know that? You didn't when you was a little boy, right? They weren't paying attention. Playing in the rocks. Someone might think, well, why have them out here? Boy, I'll tell you why you have them out there. They're being trained right there. They're being trained that, hey, I'm a man. As they grow up, I'm a man. And I remember sitting on the front steps of the church with my grandpa. My daddy was there. My uncle was there. We were out there for one reason. To pray. Whew, to pray for our families. Pray for the church. I remember that old preacher praying for his wife. That's that's what, that's what we do, guys. That's what we've been called to do. We have to be trained so that they can be trained. We teach them all kind of things without saying a word or doing a thing. We teach them stuff they don't need to know. We need to focus on training them in righteousness by example. Don't say one thing and do another. Don't do that kid like that. Do what you say, or don't say it, because kids are very, very intelligent. They pick up on things, and they see things, and they know things, and they got really, really good baloney detectors built in. God give them that. They do. So Paul warns that the church is going to be like this. In chapter 5 of Ephesians, Paul says a lot, and we're going to spend a lot of time in Ephesians 5 and 6 as we move through this series of sermons. Where do you start? And, and I'm way behind on this, and I just feel like I need to catch it up. And I'm not going to try to re-preach what we've already preached in the first sermon, but I do feel like, boy, we just got to catch up so we can get a running start because uh, we've done a lot in between. Where do you start doing life by the book? I think you start where God started. What was the first thing God did after creation? He instituted the family. If you're kin to somebody in here right now, raise your hand. And I ain't ashamed of it. Full of families. 
That's what churches are built of. That's God's intentions. Some of them wouldn't raise your hand because you don't want us to know that the guy you're sitting next to, you're kin to. But we're not going to hold that against you. First thing God did after he created the earth was he created a man, then he created a woman. Why? Because the man couldn't do it on his own. Good place for a man, women. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. Uh, but it's true. It's true. We couldn't do it on our own. Uh, so he created a helpmate, a completer. And God's man and God's woman come together for what? What purpose? Well, it's God's man, it's God's woman. Put them together for God's family. So the first thing he did was institute the family. For what? Fill the earth. To fill the earth with heathens and hellions and rebellions? No, sin come in and did all that. The purpose was to take his name over the planet. And we've done that. The family's where you start because the family is the hub of the wheel, amen or not. It really is. If, if someone was to tell you, you can come to church, but you can't bring nobody in your family, how empty would this church be? Very empty. First service, very empty without families because God works through the families. We have minimized the importance of our marriages and our families, and they can't be minimized. It's the most important thing going. It's God's first institution. God's instituted three institutions, the family, the church, and believe it or not, government, it's off the rails, but the family's the first. God does things in order, by the way. And the family's the most important. But more important than the church, we don't have a church without a family. You just really don't. So the church and the family is harmonious with each other. So the family's where we start. God ordains marriage between one man and one woman. You know, you used to didn't have to say that, did you? You used to just say marriage, and everybody knew that marriage was between a man and a woman. We don't know that anymore because our, our society is so jacked up and backwards and wrong. And, but we've got to say it now. Hey, newsflash. Doesn't matter what GQ magazine says or Oprah Winfrey or Dr. Phil or any of those other knuckleheads. Marriage can only be between one man and one woman. Can't between, it can't be between a man and a man. Or a woman and a woman. Won't work. Never will it work. So God institutes that. The marriage constitutes the family because inside the covenant of marriage is where the family's developed. The family's the first institution God ordained. In chapter 5, Paul does an amazing job getting us to the family. And what I love about this passage so much is he never changes context from 5 to 6. It just flows. There's no context change. Uh, he's not dealing with one subject and going to another subject. He puts it all together because there's one verse in here that's key to everything. And to keep us from backing all the way up to verse 1, let's start at verse 15, chapter 5 in Ephesians. If you're there, say amen. Paul says, therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. That's the most important thing we can grab a hold of, understanding the will of the Lord. And in verse 18, he says something that's almost odd. He says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that's dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, I'm just going to say a word about that. That's kind of odd, and, and reading that, you, it may, you may say, what's the correlation between being filled with the Spirit and getting drunk? Well, really nothing, unless you were raised in a pagan culture like these Ephesians was, unless all that you've ever known until the gospel of Jesus Christ come into your life was paganism, which was influenced by a Dionysian cult whose understanding was that wine, strong drink, would take you to a place through drunkenness where you could commune with the gods, little g-o-d-s. Pagan gods, not real God, false gods. And that's all they knew, and, and that's what they did. So Paul calls them out of that paganism. He says, don't get drunk with wine. That'll get you nowhere. It'll just lead to a life of excess. It'll lead to a life of self-indulgence. That's what dissipation means. It, it'll get you nowhere in life. But be filled 
with the Spirit. Because when you're filled with the Spirit, things happen. Can I just tell you this morning that being filled with the Spirit is the key to successful Christian living. Apart from being filled with the Spirit, we'll never succeed. Because there's nothing in in us. We're, We're not by nature good people. Some of us are better than others. And we look at some and say, well, I wish I could be as good as them. That just means you're way behind. But still, that's not up to the standard of Christ. The Holy Spirit indwelling us, but not just indwelling. Paul doesn't say, let the Holy Spirit indwell you. Uh, Here's what Scripture teaches. Everyone who is born of Christ, saved, born again, is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But Paul's calling us to something more. He's calling us to uh, be filled. Uh, he's, He's referring to influence. How much does the influence of the Holy Spirit reign in your life? And by the way, that word field out of the Greek, it literally means to cram, shove in and pack down. Man, just pack it in. So what he's calling us to do is letting the Holy Spirit reign and rule in our lives. The Holy Spirit coupled with God's word is how we succeed. That's what he's calling us to do, be filled with the Holy Spirit. What's some of the What's some of the uh, attributes of being filled with the Spirit? What's going to happen in my life if I'm filled with the Spirit? Look at verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. That's a Spirit-filled person. Now, is he talking about singing? Some of us can't sing. Do, do we go around singing to each other? I mean, how many of y'all walked up to Cowboy Church this morning and said, Good morning, church! Anybody do that? Just shake anybody's hand and say, I love you, brother. How you doing? Well, he ain't talking about singing because he didn't say singing. He said speaking, right? But there's a melody in the heart of those who are filled with spirit. What does that look like? Joyful. Have you ever, you know anybody that they profess Christ, but man, they're they're just always grouchy. I'm not saying sometimes. I'm not talking about when the stock market crashes. I'm talking about just, and they frown all the time. And you can't get along with them. Don't be calling no names now. Can I just tell you, that really doesn't fit with a spirit-filled person. Anybody can have a a bad day, amen or not. We all have bad days, have bad experiences, puts us in bad bad moods. But by and large, those who are filled with the Spirit, Paul says, speaking to one another in spiritual hymns. He's not talking about going around singing to each other. If you walk up, see a brother in Walmart, and you walk up and start singing to him, chances are, that's not going to be the best experience. They're going to think you, you know, it's, he's back on the dope. <laughs> I, I knew it. Knew, I knew it was going to happen. He's back. He bless his heart. He, he stayed out all night. He's in Walmart singing, wearing a Three Trees T-shirt. <laughs> Don't do that. He's talking about the joy in your life. The joy that we have. <laughs> Don't get me laughing. You know what happens. Making melody with your heart to who? The Lord. Next thing he says in verse 20. Now, there's a couple keys in here you need to see. Always giving thanks for all things. So you're always doing it, and you're always doing it for all things. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Spirit-filled people have the capability of doing that. Now, I want you to think how big that is. In every situation, we give thanks. Matter of fact, Paul in 1 Thessalonians calls us, in everything be thankful. Now, remember, we've already looked at 2 Timothy 3.16, and Paul says, all scriptures God breathed. Every word in here is of God, from God. It's how God feels. It's how he His heart is, and so when Paul says all things at all times, that's not a, he didn't misspeak. 
He wants us to understand that spirit-filled people are to always be thankful. In bad situations, preacher, absolutely. In situations that we don't agree with, yes. In every situation. How can we do that? Because the spirit enhances our knowledge. It brings it to light. It puts us in the practice. See, the knowledge is this. God is sovereign. God is on the throne. Nothing happens in my life unless God okays it. So I'm thankful for it. Spirit-filled people are like that. Now, this is going somewhere. I want you to know where we're going. Look at the next thing he says in verse 21. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. This is a biggie, man, because we don't like to be subjected are submissive, are subservient to anyone. And really, what Paul's calling us to here is in the Christian world, in the Christian life, those who are filled with the Spirit have the capability of doing what all of us need to do, and that's put the other guy first. We don't do that, do we? We don't like that. We like them parking places up front. Some of you guys here at this Cowboy Church have created parking spots out of nothing. Hey, Bub, your, your, your truck there, it's your, your, your driver's side's up on the building. I know, but nobody parks there. For six inches of ground, man, we'll wreck a new truck. That's us. That's how we, that's, that's how we are. The lunch line. I had somebody come out of the first service and said, Preacher, he's looking at me when you said that. I know. I know where you sit. My neck's connected to my brain. I I know where to point it. But I wasn't looking at him. He was just joking. Lunch line, how do we do? Ding, 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 ding. Get that wheelchair out of the way. Give me my sandwich. We ain't that bad, are we? Just watch the world, guys. But we're not talking about the world. We're talking about the church. Spirit-filled people die to themselves. Uh, We're studying this every morning, man, here at the Cowboy Church. We're learning the heart of God, and uh, we're to be abiders. And in order to be abiders, Greg Wilson, what we got to do? We got to die. We got to die to ourselves. We got to die to our desires. We got to die. It ain't about me. It's about the Lord and his people, and I'm going to put his people first. This ain't natural to us, guys. What's natural to us is survival mode. Survival mode. But notice how Paul, in verse 21, goes right into verse 22. There's There's no context change, and he picks up the family. And he says, wives be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wife ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, verse 25, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Woo! Hmm. Submission, love that calls for submission, that ain't normal to us, man. So Paul's going right into the family setting. Paul's going right into the marriage setting. By the way, let me set you wives free on something. In this passage, Paul does not say, Let me catch up with my notes. Paul's instructions are not for women to be subject to men. Did you see that in there anywhere? Paul doesn't say, women, be subject to men. It's not what he's saying. Text doesn't say it. Paul don't even say wives be subject to husbands, does he? He says wives be subject to your own husbands. This is not a male-female thing. This is a positional thing that God ordained in the marriage setting. See, if you're married, that don't mean you have to be subject to everybody else's husband. Amen or not. Yeah. 
And if you're a female, I don't mean you have to be subjected to males or submissive to males. But in the home, in the, in the, in the institution of marriage, God has given positions. You don't get to choose yours, I don't get to choose mine. We only are responsible for filling those roles. That ought to set you free. So we can be certain that the only way this can take place is being filled with the Holy Spirit. Women are not naturally submissive. Good place to say amen, guys. Bunch of cowards. One amen, and he wasn't even married. That's true, though, right? It's position. Husband and wives constitute marriage, amen or not. Anything apart from that's not marriage. By the way, you know God owns marriage, right? Yeah, he created it, he owns it. So we need to look at marriage, don't we? We, we, we need to take a strong look at marriage. Here's been my experience. In the time I've been in the ministry, my experience has been number one problem between husband and wife is incompatibility. Now, I'm not talking about one loves pizza and the other loves, loves cheeseburgers. That can be overcome. Restaurants serve all kinds of stuff. Incompatibility. I'm not talking about one wants to live in the country and one wants to live in the city. Move halfway, that's solved. I'm not talking about one drives a Ford and one drives a Chevy. That can be fixed. Buy you a Dodge. <laughs> There's ways around this stuff, guys. I, I'm, I'm not talking about anything like that. Here's what I am talking about, though. One knows Jesus and is full of the Holy Spirit and is a possession of Christ. And Christ uses his possessions. So you can be assured with that one who's full of Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. God's going to begin to direct that person, and, and whether it's the man or whether it's the woman, whether it's the husband, whether it's the wife. God's going to begin to direct them and use them and call them and put them to work and call them to sacrifice. And they're going to be one that's uh, thankful for everything. And they're going to be one that's uh, got a melody in their heart for the Lord. And they're going to be one that's subject to others. But the incompatible partner who don't know the Lord, who's not full of the Spirit, is going that away. When God's calling his possession, that away. And there's where the problem is almost every time. Here's what we run into. So many young couples get married. Uh, I'm talking about couples that might have grown up in church. I'm talking about couples that might have been baptized. I'm talking about couples that uh, may have said a prayer somewhere, somewhere and they consider themselves saved. Let me just, I did this on the first sermon. Listen, young ladies, don't marry a guy just because he says he's a Christian. Don't, don't marry someone because he says, I've been saved. Don't marry someone because they say, I've been baptized. Marry them based on the fact that you can see the Holy Spirit very active in their life. Listen, young men, don't marry young ladies just because they're so stinking pretty. Man, they make makeup nowadays that every woman's pretty. You wash that stuff off, what are you going to do then? You know that's true. I mean, they just got the stuff now that ain't no ugly folks on planet Earth. Man, they can make me look good. <laughs> no response, please. You do, but we're designed to be visual, right? What attracts a man to a woman? Boy, she can swing a hammer. That ain't never happened. She dips the same snuff I dip. That ain't never happened. It's because you look and you, you have to look again. And you go, oh, hello. <laughs> Same thing with women. And I said this is the first service. I never have figured out how, come, how women can look at a guy and say, oh, he's cute. I ain't never seen a cute guy. <laughs> Hairy, ugly. But we're designed that way. Visual stimulus gets us in trouble. And it, but that's where it's going to start every time. Now, let me just pull a wagon over right here, put the brake over, and back up. Because naturally, those who are looking for the other partner is going to work off visual stimulus. 
they're cute, their teeth's white, they're tan, their hair's pretty, whatever. That's where the parents come in. You see, God give you your kids' parents to train them in righteousness. Literally, a parent is a steward over a gift. And, and their goal as a parent is to train them so that when the right time comes, they make right decisions, and then you go, set them free. Right? Now, a lot of you, especially you mamas, you want to, no, you ain't got to go. You got to go. You got to get out of my house. That's the goal of the parent. To, come on, come on. But while you're easing them out of the, they, they're making good decisions, such as, oh, mom, he is so gorgeous. Is he full of the Spirit? Now, let me just, let me say what I know right now. That's rare. That's rare among God's people. The first question I asked my son-in-law, as he's sitting right there, you can ask him, where do you go to church? That was the initial question. Where do you go to church? That's important to me. But that ain't enough. I got to watch you, boy. Got to be around you, boy. Can I take your daughter out and off? She can come to the house. A lot of time at the house. Why is that? Because I'm a steward over my daughters. Was. Still am. I'm dad. I'm still dad, guys. Looking for someone who's filled with the Spirit. We have to train our kids to do that. Because, see, while they're watching 10 hours of TV, Hollywood's training them to do something else. While they're with their friends... They're training them to do something else. They're training them to look for white teeth and tan legs and pretty hair and all the latest fashions and the cool language and the, the popular kids. That's what they're training them to do. And God's Word says, I'm going to call you to do some things, and in order for you to achieve this, you've got to be filled with my Spirit. And when you get to where I want you, that's all that's going to matter. Because all of the visual stimulus stuff goes away anyway. Man, hey, I used to be skinny. I said I used to be skinny. Don't act like you don't believe me. I'm telling you now, I used to be skinny. It's proven. I got pictures. My head used to not be so big. It won't quit growing. The visual stuff just gets all rearranged and what used to be where it was supposed to be. Now it ain't there no more and it don't work anyway, so who cares? The visual stuff don't last. And we have to train our children. Look, it ain't all about looks. It ain't all about popularity. Matter of fact, that's just bonus stuff. What you're looking for in a man or in a woman is someone who is filled with God's Spirit. Because when you say, I do, and you enter that covenant of marriage, God's intention is for you to stay there till you die. And in between I do and death, there's all kind of issues you've got to overcome. And it takes a spirit-filled person to overcome those issues. Try to start an argument with someone who's thankful for all things at all times. You can't. Come in grouchy, married to a spirit-filled person. They're thankful you're grouchy. Praise the Lord. That, that mean booger's home. That's spirit-filled people. You ever tried to argue with somebody smiling? Ooh, it makes it worse. Does it not? What's you smiling for? Quit smiling. This ain't funny. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God's going to see you through this. Get out of your flesh, husband. Get out of your flesh, wife. Just if you got two spirit-filled people, they're not even going to go there, right? Or if they do, it's going to turn out funny. Because that melody in their heart, right? But what we have is a generation of churched people who have married people. Now listen, I'm fixing to say something strong. You ain't going to like it. They've married people they should have never married. 
And then they want to seek counseling. Fix my husband. Fix my wife. Preacher, if you just talk to her and get her saved, preachers don't save people. I can't save your spouse. You should have thought about that when you were dating, when you were so keened in on the white teeth and them tan legs. Hey, she was lost in too. He was lost in too. Parents, if you'd have trained that child to look for the attributes of God's word in that individual, because you're going to spend the rest of your life with them. But we've gotten so far away from the book and it's so clear and it's so easy for us to understand what God expects out of his people. And he's telling us here, look, the only way you can achieve what I've designed you to be is by being filled with me. And the person that you marry has to be filled with me. Because when she's filled with me and you're filled with me, blessings flow. Most couples spend most of their time trying to get along. How's God going to use you when you're fighting? I can tell when y'all fight, by the way. Walk into church, y'all swolled up. I know everybody fights on Sunday mornings. Husband got that old look like, man, I had to ride with her to church. <laughs> Happens all the time. You know, the first question I ask somebody when they say, will you marry me? Tell me about your faith. Sounds good. Tell me about your, your fiance's faith. I think she's saved. Get out of my office. I don't say that. I don't say that. I'm not that crude. I'm rough, but not that rough. That's where I become a pastor. What do you mean you think she's saved? You're going to invest the rest of your life in someone you don't even know? Knows your Lord? Are you kidding me? Paul says, do not be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. And then he says this, for what does light and darkness? You see the contrast? What does light and darkness have in common? The answer is nothing. Because light makes darkness flee. We don't preach this stuff anymore because even preachers are getting away from the book. Doing life by the book means that parents understand God's going to call us to do some things. We have to be spirit-filled. If I'm going to do this thing with my partner, she's got to be spirit-filled or he's got to be spirit-filled. Train your kids in such a way. Be involved in your kid's life. Know who they're talking to. Know who they're dating. And dad, be willing to stand up and say, no, nope, you ain't dating him. Don't be their buddies. Don't be their buddies. They don't need a buddy. They got buddies. They need someone who loves them so much and understands God's clear call on their life that that dad, that mom is willing to lock arm in arm. They're willing to be united to fight for that child's future. And the best way you can fight for is, is instruct them in the truth of God's law. We're losing our families because of that. Yeah, I hear this all the time. I don't know what's happened to them. We didn't raise them that way. Yeah, you really did. You really did raise them that way because you didn't invest into them. You tried to be their friend. Well, my dad wasn't ever my friend. He's my friend now. He's 83 years old. He's my buddy now. He was my daddy. And he told me right from wrong. And he didn't even know God's word, but he knew right from wrong. This is what God's calling us to, to live by the book. One of the biggest blessings we have at this Cowboy Church is those nurseries are filled with little gobbledygooks over there just crawling on the walls. And we love them, don't we? We love kids. All of you who God's blessed your womb and fruit come from it, you're a steward. Daddy, listen to me. You fight for that child. Not with your fist. God's word. You can teach them how to ride and teach them how to rope, teach them how to drive, teach them how to ski. All that's good stuff. So teach them how to knock the ball, plumb over the fence. That won't matter when they're grown. They're not going to make it to the major league. Statistics is very much against that. Uh, they're probably not going to make it to the NFR. Statistics are very much against that. But you know what they are going to do? They're going to marry somebody. 
They're either going to spend the rest of their life with them and produce other offsprings, or they're not. That's pretty much a given and certain. Invest where it matters. And the way we invest is through God's word. When we do life by the book and we start with the family, we can expect the blessings. Now I'm going to finish with this. Wherever you're at right now in life, I don't care how many mistakes you've made. I don't care how wrong you've got it up to this point. Make today the beginning of doing it right. Make that move. Make that commitment. I'm going to begin doing life by the book. Come hell or high water. Today I commit to do life by the book. And watch what God can do in your life. Amen or not.